Well, hello everyone. Thank you so much for coming to my presentation. Today's workshop is all about cloud security and the Google Cloud platform. This workshop is aimed at individuals who are novice to about intermediate in cloud security and are really looking to understand more about the topic and the Google Cloud platform security offerings. My goal for today is for you to walk away with having a very clear understanding about the foundation of cloud security and how to set up your own basic cloud deployment environment in GCP so that way you can test and play around with things further. There is a live demo portion. So I encourage you to sign up for the platform um, beforehand, like while I'm doing my slides, um, so you can follow along if you have not done so already. And I'll show you how to do so in just a few. Okay, so let's, let's get this sharing going. One second. <laughs> cool. Cool, 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 cool. All right. Hopefully you are seeing my slides now. <laughs> And if not, you can let me know. Okay. So let's take a look at our agenda for today. I will be giving you a pretty thorough introduction of cloud security and an overview of the Google Cloud Platform. I promise not to put you to sleep. <laughs> I'm gonna try not to put you to sleep. I know we're here for a good two hours or like an hour 45 plus questions. And I really wanted to make sure that I'm giving you as much information as you can and give you a ton of useful information for you to take back and go be your own, you know, cloud security practitioner later on. <laughs> so we will start with a quick fun fact introduction about myself, and then we will dive into an overview of cloud security. We will include things like the cloud service models, deployments, some benefits, uh, frameworks, and then we will dive into the actual platform overview with a live demo. Now, the Google Cloud Platform has a large variety of offerings, but for the purpose of today's workshop, we're only going to be covering three major domains, and that is identity and access management, aka IAM, uh, infrastructure services, which is virtual machines, and then security tools, which is Stack Driver. That's what we will be focusing on today. And in our hands-on demo, we will be doing three different tasks, including getting started learning about roles and identities, which is super important when getting started um, in the platform. And then we will set up our own infrastructure services and then attach a security solution to monitor it. So, sounds good. Let's get started and I will show you what to do next. Now, before we get started with everything, if you wanna participate in the demo, you need to set up your lab. And to set up your lab, you need to go ahead and go to www.console.cloud.google.com. And if you don't already have an account, it's going to prompt you to create one. I suggest you create two because a lot of what we'll be doing today and a lot of what you'll be doing in the future will require you to kind of test on two different accounts to see about access. Um, and I have two different accounts that we'll be going through today. So if you want to do the same, you will have to do this twice. If you're okay with just walking through in the first place just to get to know a little bit about the dashboard, you just have to create one account. Once you're all set up, um, it'll ask you to prompt you to put in your credit card information. I promise you they will not charge you. I've created so many free accounts here. <laughs> they will not charge you. Um, it is just a free trial activation. And it's if you want to do it in the future, it is not automatically charging you. It will stop and it will prompt you way beforehand. So once you're set up, we'll visit this later, but this is where you need to go. Please take a screenshot of this. Okay. Let's get started. So again, my name is Dominique West. I am the Atlanta chapter lead for Women's Society of Cyber Jutsu, who's hosting today. Um, during the day, I serve as a senior cloud security consultant for Ernst & Young, a multinational consulting services firm. I've been in the industry for eight years now, um, and I've been doing various technical roles until I found what I really like, which is now cloud security at the moment. <laughs> Some, like I started off wanting to do a lot of red teaming, 
Then I was doing a lot of uh, defensive uh, uh, security roles. And then I came into cloud security and I really enjoy this space, right? It's a maturing space. Everyone's trying to take part of it. I really like it. Next, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna change something in another couple of years. I've really been interested in machine learning, so I might go there. So outside of my day job, I am the founder of Security in Color, a cyber and cloud security podcast and platform with the aim of educating the masses on security industry news and topics. And when my life is not revolving around security, it's revolving around BTS because I'm a really, really huge fan of the K-pop group. And I love chocolate, I love reading, and I love The Sims, I love playing video games. And I always put in my slides that I love chocolate because I know it's common, everyone says, oh, I love chocolate, but I really eat my body weight in chocolate about once a week, right? And that's why I have to work out so hard because I eat a lot of chocolate. But anyway, <laughs> okay, so let's jump into things and let's break down some cloud security. Now, we may have a variety of experiences and levels watching this workshop. But regardless, I really wanted to make sure that I'm covering some really foundational um, aspects of cloud security that you should be able to speak to no matter what level you are, um, especially if you are a aspiring professional looking to getting into consulting or looking to you know, drive some kind of cloud adoption strategy for your organization, right? Because everyone's organization at some point is in the cloud. And if you want to take part in that, right, or if you're someone who's trying to pivot to that, you should really know these concepts. So that way you can speak to it later on and kind of leverage yourself as a subject matter expert, right? So I will cover some definitions, the benefits of the cloud, some models that you will encounter, and some security challenges you should be familiar with. So what is cloud security? Well, cloud security can be defined as a set of policies, controls, procedures, and technologies that really work together to protect cloud-based systems, data, and infrastructure. And these security measures are configured and put into place to really help protect your assets, right? Such as cloud data. And it helps support an organization needing to meet regulatory compliance, for example, especially if they are maybe an industry that processes credit card information, you'd be under PCI. Or if you're processing um, personal data from those who live in Europe, we've all heard about GDPR by now. So it's really there to help protect consumer privacy and a really huge benefit to cloud computing is that it comes with a lot of hands security that you typically don't get on premise or in traditional security models. Benefits such as the following and many, many more. There's so many, if you go and research, you will find a ton of different benefits. And these are just a few that I wanted to highlight. And they really contribute to why about 94% of enterprises are currently utilizing the cloud in some way. And we have benefits such as efficiency and collaboration, which allow users to communicate and share information with each other more easily outside of traditional methods. So for example, many of us are working remotely right now because of the pandemic. And possibly in companies, you know, who have users that are around the world, right? And cloud computing allows the ability to provide resources to all of these users in a really quick and efficient manner. And all businesses, you know, they want to be competitive. Everyone's trying to be first to market. Everyone wants their customers coming and getting their product. Are they becoming number one or going viral? And cloud computing allows enterprises to quickly analyze big data. We hear about big data a lot and respond by going to the market quicker than their counterparts who are not utilizing technology. And typically this was only available to really large corporations who had the capital to invest in this type of technology. But now uh, small business owners, medium, large, regular users, like now we have access to this technology at a price that meets our budget or a small business owner's budget. And then speaking of budget, because you know money is always <laughs> involved in whatever new technology, cost reduction is probably the 
the biggest reason why a business would invest in a new technology, including cloud computing. And the overhead cost to manage and maintain your IT systems is drastically reduced when you move into a cloud model. And no more businesses, they don't need to like set aside huge budgets. They don't need to figure out this big procurement process that usually takes about a year in order to set up whatever they're trying to do a year from now. Like they don't have to do that. All of the labor costs to like maintain systems, do upgrades, do patching, making sure they have the right expertise for their, you know, their staff and training, like all of that is drastically reduced, um, which of course the higher ups, the CEOs, the CFOs, they really love to hear that money is going, they don't have to spend that much money. Scalability uh, refers to the ability to expand or decrease uh, cloud resources in a really fast way. And you will hear the terms scale up or scale down very, very often in this field. And it's really talking about the flexibility of cloud computing um, that it enables the organization to be able to do. So similar to the cost advantage that I spoke to uh, prior, enterprises can take advantage of their cloud service provider to kind of really buy and handle um, the hardware while they focus on just using whatever service that they need, get up and running, get or scale down as quickly as much. So when you hear about scale up, scale down, that's really about a company um, adding more resources so that way they can uh, take care of the traffic that they have or scaling down so they can go back to their normal size and normal payment schedule. And of course, we wouldn't be here talking about cloud security or any of that if security wasn't an important factor. Um, and the enhanced abilities that the cloud really enables um, organizations and enterprises. And cloud-based solutions really have enhanced a enterprise's security posture to higher standards that usually is really hard for them to achieve um, traditionally in their environment. So, and as you know, with the constantly evolving and increased uh, threat landscape, it's now become imperative that security becomes a focus as enterprises make their transition to the cloud. And this transition shifts the dynamic of security offerings. You know, it gives you benefits such as, you know, centralized security. It allows an enterprise to essentially manage um, the really now shattered security perimeter, right? Now, you might have heard like, there's this box. If you look up security perimeter, you'll usually see like a box and all of your assets are inside, right? That's the traditional security perimeter that has been around since the beginning of security time, right? But now that has been shattered when it comes to the cloud and I'll get more into the security perimeter model and like framework and shared security and all that in a little bit. But the average environment for an enterprise now consists of numerous devices and endpoints that can be pretty difficult for small teams to manage, especially when it comes to things like shadow IT or when bring your own devices start to, um, to come into play, especially because everyone's at home. So now, you know, like your secure, your, your at home network now becomes a part of the equation. And cloud-based tools allow security teams to kind of streamline this process of monitoring the network so teams can analyze and take action all in one place. Now, shared security refers to the burden of security overhead and oversight being shared by the cloud service provider and the organization who's taking part of it. And I'll go into detail. I have a whole slide about this that's coming up. Now, other benefits like protection against DDoS attacks or also called distribute um, denial of service attacks and the ability to shift from a reactive state to a proactive state is super important. And with the increased amount of threats faced in the cloud, it is important that enterprises have the tools and resources necessary to combat them. Now in security, we're typically in a reactive state for the most part, meaning we take care of threats as they come to fruition and we handle incidents after a breach occurs. And a proactive approach to cybersecurity includes preemptively identifying your security vulnerabilities and then adding processes to identify um, threats before they occur. That way we don't have to continuously be 
one step behind attackers, right? We are always trying to be one step ahead. So that way we can be ready for anything that's coming. Um, and unfortunately, it's been really hard for security teams and security professionals to be able to do so. There's a variety of factors that play a part in that. But for the most part, we are really trying to achieve becoming more proactive. And the cloud really helps you to be able to get to that state. Now, before you can go deploying and putting data in the cloud, it is important that security teams understand a couple of things when it comes to cloud computing, including service models, deployment models, and shared responsibility. Now, there are three models of cloud services to choose from. They are software as a service, platform as a service, and infrastructure as a service. Each of these models has its own benefits. And it's really good to understand the differences and impl implications each might have on your environment. Now you are not limited to choosing only one. There are plenty of enterprises that have a combination of two or three X, Y, Z. It's really up to the needs of your organization. So let's go through them one by one. So that way you have a more, you have a better understanding about what service models are. So software as a service is the most commonly used of the three models. And you're probably familiar with this model and you might not even know it. So I'm utilizing this model right now by delivering this presentation via Google Slides. Typically, traditionally, I would have to access, create, and present using a local application, like a lo local PowerPoint application on my laptop. And instead, now I can use this service by just going to the URL looking up Google presentations or Google slides it's called um, and use their service and deliver it and be able to access it anywhere. I don't need my laptop per se, I just need my account and an internet connection. Having to update and manage this application is not under my control. It's not my problem anymore. Google handles that for me and I simply use the service. Now, while this may be the easiest and cheapest option for most enterprises to use. It also provides the least amount of security for an organization. And therefore, those organizations who need more granular control or more control over their security elements of their software, um, this option might not be for you. <laughs> uh, platform as a service is our second option here. And that's really mainly used by developers for applications. Now this model delivers a framework for these developers and they build upon it and they can create custom applications. Now here, um, developers or users, whoever's using it, they get a little bit more control over some of the infrastructure components, a little bit, and I emphasize on a little bit, right? Because you can't customize it as much as you can with the next service that I'm gonna speak to but it's not as strict as the last one. And that also really depends on who you are using as your cloud service provider for this particular model. Now, you get to do things like you sometimes can maybe manage your server. You can maybe um, have control over your storage, uh, but it really just depends on the cloud service provider and how much control they wanna give you. And it also depends on what size your organization is. So similar where I said with software as a service, how um, you don't have that much control, you can't really do anything. If you are a large enterprise, um, sometimes they might allow you to do some uh, custom, maybe user experience um, design changes. Meaning if you are a large corporation and you have certain font that you use, you might have a certain color scheme, you kind of want it all to be uniform, you want all your applications to be under the same branding, um, that cloud service provider might let you change that, right? But that's about it. They won't let you change that much more outside of that. And our third option is infrastructure as a service. So infrastructure as a service is the most flexible of all three options, and it provides users with the most control in terms of security and configuration. And that's because this really is a full self-service kind of model, which it provides resources like compute, you know, your storage, your networking, uh, your firewalls, all of that. All of that is given to you in this um, model. 
And this model is really best for organizations that require that granularity that I was talking about before, especially if you're under compliance. Um, and what's important to note here is that the user or the customer organization, enterprise, XYZ, whatever name you wanna fill in here, you are responsible for the management way more than you are in the other two. And this model will cause the most headache if it's not thoroughly understood in terms of how to set up, how to configure and how to monitor this environment. So examples of this would be AWS, like Azure, GCP, which we're gonna get into, IBM Cloud, all of that good nature. So a better way to differentiate between the models that I just spoke to can be seen here. Now, the question of what is my security responsibility in the cloud is often and should be brought up often <laughs> as enterprises migrate their data to the cloud. And the answer is really simple and explained by this shared security model that you see um, on this slide. And it really can help prevent a lot of future headaches or misconfigurations, which we don't want to happen. So the key to success in understanding your responsibility is to understand that security of the cloud versus security in the cloud. Okay, there we go. <laughs> and to put this visualization simply, you're a cloud service provider. So think Google, AWS, IBM, Microsoft, XYZ. They're responsible for security infrastructure and management of the cloud. And the customer is responsible for securing everything in the cloud. So visually, you can see that the green is what you manage and it goes down little by little as you go from the on-premise model to the software as a service model. So remember I said before, software as a service, you don't manage anything, but you also have no control of anything. Whereas on the opposite end of the spectrum on on-premise, you do. Now, this has to be said because I will be doing you a disservice if I do not. And that is the cloud is not secure by default, okay? I would say it again, the cloud is not <laughs> secure by default. And it really is a common misconception that again will lead you to misconfigurations in the cloud. It leads you to headaches or possibly future headlines or lawsuits. And we don't want that, right? We don't, we don't have time for that. We don't want that. So you must configure and secure your data at all times. Your data, your responsibility. <laughs> So in infrastructure as a service, like I said before, you have more control, more configurations to deal with. This includes things like installing your OS, patching your applications, securing your data, configuring firewalls, picking which OS you're gonna use, all of that. Platform as a service gives up a little bit more control, kind of really just manage the security of your applications, maybe some control of your data. And software as a service, you give up all control, you just use it. Greatly differs, again, from the things on the side. Okay, so in addition to having to choose a service model when figuring out how to architect your cloud environment, organizations also must choose what kind of deployment model best suits their needs. Now, cloud deployment model indicates how the service models are gonna be made available to users. And the four deployment models associated with cloud computing are public, private, community, and hybrid. Now, each model's name, pretty self-explanatory, pretty self but I will give you a quick overview and really help you understand like when is it best to choose which one. So public, as the name suggests, supports all users who want to make use of cloud computing resources, whether it's hardware or software, and it really is on a subscription basis. So you know, how I just told you to go to GCP and like create your account and it gives you 300 credits and then uh, it's a pay as you go model. Like that's a subscription based service is that it's giving you services each month you pay them similar to like Netflix, like you pay them monthly to use their products, same as public. Private cloud is typically used by a single organization. Now the infrastructure may be managed either by the organization itself. So my ABC organization, I might be um, configuring and managing it myself, or it might be outsourced to a third party. 
service provider who will do that management for me, whether on site or off site. And private clouds are the most expensive option um, because it involves a lot of capital expenditure. You have to do a lot of upfront costs, which is the opposite of public clouds because a lot of companies don't want to do that upfront cost anymore. They don't want to be the ones responsible having to pay so much money to invest in the hardware and software and all that XYZ that I spoke to before. So going with private cloud, will you'll still have that bill basically. Um, however, private clouds are much better to address like the security and privacy concerns that organizations are having today. Now, community cloud models um, support multiple organizations who are sharing computing resources that are part of a community. And examples of this model include universities maybe that are all doing maybe similar kinds of research and they need to share some um, knowledge and data with each other in order to help build some models or help continue build out their research. Or it could be something like police departments that are in the same county or within the same state who want to share databases with one another, share resources with one another. So that way it's easier from one station to another in order to um, kind of correlate information. Um, that's where you would typically see the community model and access to community clouds are usually restricted to just members of that community. So like universities won't be mixing with police officers, like they won't mix. <laughs> so in a hybrid cloud, an organization makes use of interconnected private and public cloud infrastructure. So you're mixing the private and the public cloud together. And many organizations typically use this um, model when they need to kind of scale up their IT infrastructure. They want to take advantage of the cloud, um, but they don't want to give up control of their really sensitive data and they want to have that on premise. Or they might need to be able to scale up really quickly um, in order to address some, um, like if they know, uh, for example, um, an, on an online retailer, for example, like they might need more computing resources because this Christmas they're going to have this huge sale, right? They're gonna be giving away like 75% off of everything and they expect their traffic network to increase drastically, very quickly. And they don't have enough time to buy the hardware, buy, install, you know, maintain, update all of that before the sale happens. So they would probably just scale up their current infrastructure using a cloud service and then once they're finished with it, they will scale down. And a noteworthy mention as it's gaining a lot of traction for enterprises who have a little bit more maturity in the cloud is the multi-cloud deployment model. And this model distributes cloud assets, software, applications, and more across several cloud environments. So for example, I might have something in AWS and then something in GCP. And it really is utilizing two or more public clouds in a private cloud with the aim to eliminate the reliance on being with one uh, cloud service provider. So I see we have an audience question. It says, it seems it's possible to have a shared tenant in Azure, not sure how company can get the most security on a shared tenant. So are you asking that their company, you're in the public cloud and you're trying to figure out how to best secure your data on the public cloud, um, which can get very complicated depending on your security needs. So I guess the best answer that if you're saying, hey, my company's on, yeah, that my company is using Azure and we're on a public cloud and I'm trying to figure out how to best configure my security in my environment, I would definitely recommend I have some best practices that I'm gonna get into in a few. Um, but if you're on a public cloud, you have to assume the, you have to be comfortable assuming the risk that comes with being on a public cloud, right? And that risk can come from a variety of things and not only comes from you being able to properly configure your environment, but it also accounts for your cloud service provider might also mess up. They might also have something that happens that might affect your environment. It might turn something on, turn something off, some things that I will get to in later, but um, there are some best practices that you can do if that was your question. There we go, cloud security best practices. <laughs> 
Um, I couldn't end this 10,000 foot overview of cloud security without really highlighting best practices you should be familiar with when implementing security in the cloud. Now, the specifics of your enterprise cloud security strategy will really vary depending on, you know, the specific requirements of your environment, what kind of applications you have. Um, but here I listed um, six really good best practices that, you know, security professionals should know at a foundational level. There are plenty more, of course. This is not the only six that you should know, but um, you should at least know these. <laughs> so the first is being um, making sure that you are deploying an IAM solution, identity and access management. In a survey by Cloud Passage, unauthorized access and account hijacking are the two biggest security threats to public clouds. Now, having a high quality IAM solution can really help mitigate a lot of these threats because identity is now becoming the new security perimeter model. So remember before I was talking about the security perimeter, which was this like box where this represents your network, right? This is your security perimeter where you will put all of your um, IDS, your IPS, all of your security monitoring, alerting, X, Y, Z there, and all of your assets are inside and you're really just trying to protect this perimeter. But that isn't the case anymore because you have devices that are out of your network. You have things that are coming in from different places that you might not be familiar with. Like things have vastly changed when it comes to the cloud. So making sure and shifting from using your network as your perimeter to using identity as your perimeter um, is becoming more of a norm in the cloud. And you might be familiar, you know, uh, uh, you might be familiar with the traditional model if you're still um, someone who's working a lot on premise, but the identity perimeter or identity as the new security perimeter um, is a term that you should get familiar with and how that plays a part in enhancing IAM solutions um, in the environment. Because unfortunately, that, that, that the traditional model doesn't work anymore. Um, and with your identity, you can assess a variety of factors in order to make a decision as to whether or not this person should have access to my resources. And those decision factors can be something like location, right? Is this person trying to access it from a commonly known location? Um, which also can be a little bit difficult, especially for customers that are, I mean, not customers, for users that are traveling, right? I'm a consultant, I travel pretty often. Um, and I travel weekly, so am I, where am I accessing it from this time? Is it from Atlanta where I'm based? Or is it from somewhere overseas, right? And then conditional access, which comes a part of IAM, conditional access will take that, all of these factors, it would take like your location, your device compliance, whether or not you have um, an agent on your device that says, hey, I am secure or I'm adhering to my company's device policies. Um, or the type of application that I'm trying to access. If I work in security, I shouldn't be trying to access applications that are used just by my HR team. Or if someone is in finance, they shouldn't be trying to access something that the developers use, right? So conditional access will take all of those factors and it will add them together and will say, hey, this person um, is good to go. They can access this resource. They can access this resource. Or they say, no, um, I might need a little bit more information. Maybe I need you to do an extra step of multi-factor authentication, or maybe you just shouldn't have access at all. IAM is such a huge topic. It will, I will be here forever <laughs> if I get into all of that. So IAM is definitely a very, 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 very good best practice that you should know about. Now, training should always be a continuous process in our field, right? We're always studying, we're always training, we're always learning. And it is important for organizations to empower their teams with the tools and knowledge necessary to be successful. And this training shouldn't just be limited to IT teams. It, security awareness is for everybody. Um, all of everyone is going to be utilizing the cloud. So they should know what they should be looking out for, right? You should be telling your users about phishing. You should be warning them about applications and APIs and how they're connecting and whether or not they're using their personal email addresses or corporate email addresses. Like all of that is really important information for everybody. Now we spoke about the shared responsibility model earlier and you know that's just a topic that's always gonna be carried with you in this journey. 
And endpoint security isn't new, it's not a new topic, um, but with the expanded landscape that now includes things like IoT devices, BYOD devices, and during this pandemic, like I said, your network, your home network is now a part of this environment. It really is important that your cloud assets are protected from every device that is requesting access to your resources. And compliance is a feat complicated enough without adding the cloud, but trying to achieve it in the cloud now with the added frameworks, like it's just not easy at all. And as I stated before, just as you are not secure by default, you are not compliant by default. Your cloud service provider might be compliant. Again, compliance of the cloud. You need to make sure your environment is compliant within the cloud. And lastly, deploying intrusion detection and intrusion protection services solutions. You know, they really help organizations effectively identify when an attack has occurred and help take action when something is in progress. Okay, let's do a really quick agenda check. <laughs> um, I like to include these to kind of break up the content a little bit and show you like how we're progressing in our journey. I'm a journey kind of person. I like big pictures. <laughs> so I like to show people like where we're going on this journey, on this ride with me. Um, and with long presentations, I know it can seem like content is never ending. And my goal, again, isn't to put you to sleep. So we did our 10,000 foot overview of security. I hope that was pretty insightful and giving you some, you know, an overview of the major topics that you'll encounter as you're, if you're an aspiring cloud security professional. Um, and then next up, we will dive into Google. Again, Google offers a ton of services, but we will be narrowing down the scope to just uh, three domains, which is identity and access management, we're going to cover security and some virtualization services. But first, I'm going to get some quick water because I have been talking for a lot. I hope you guys have water and snacks with you as well. OK, so any questions before I jump into the next part? Otherwise, we can keep it going. No questions. OK, cool. So Google Cloud Platform. Oh, by the way, in case you're joining late or you forgot this in the beginning, <laughs> now is a really good time to <laughs> set up your environment because we will be switching soon, upcoming back and forth um, to the platform, to slides. Like I'm going to do an overview of the domain and then we will be jumping into the dashboard. So again, here's the instructions. Please take a screenshot. Go ahead and activate. We'll be good. Okay, so overview of the Google Cloud Platform. The Google Cloud Platform is a suite of cloud services hosted on Google's infrastructure. Now from computing and storage to data analytics, machine learning, networking, GCP offers a wide variety of services and APIs that can be integrated with any cloud computing application or project, whether it's personal or for enterprises. Now, among the various cloud service providers, Google's popularity really comes from the innovation of its tools and services, right? We're all familiar with Google and how forward thinking and how much they push for the edge when it comes to technology. And Gartner had announced that Google Cloud is a leader in the infrastructure magic quadrant, which is something that we'll be diving into to see why they're so good at their infrastructure services for the past two years, and they're continuing to always expand their service offerings. Now, Google Cloud has been expanding across the globe, and the reason is because they offer so many services to its users that include, you know, compute, uh, storage, networking, they have big data, security and identity management, management tools, they have cloud AI, internet of things, like there's so much you can do in the cloud that sometimes it could, it like I can understand how it can be overwhelming. You're like, where do I get started? So it, it sometimes uh, you, it's easy to like look at their services and map out what you're interested in doing and for organizations to really understand where it is that you're trying to go, right? What am I currently doing on premise? And how does that translate to the cloud? A lot of the cloud service providers makes that very easy for you guys, right? So if on-premise I am, uh, my company is 
uh, full of developers, right? Then I know I'm doing platform as a service and you would go to their Google app engine, right? Or if I know that I'm heavy into having legacy applications, I need a bunch of virtual machines put together, then I know I need to go into infrastructure services and they have that with their Google compute engine, which we'll get into. I know my business is into containerization. You got Kubernetes, like there's just so many things that you can map um, but to the cloud, it's really just understanding what services are being offered and how does that correlate with what I got going on already. So again, I'm not going to go into all their services because we'll be here forever and there's plenty of other talks that I want you guys to go listen to, but I will give you enough to get you started on your own journey and that way you can set up your environment and play with things later. So. Now, when it comes to IAM, Identity and Access Management, and DLP, which is Data Loss um, Protection, um, Google has two main, uh, two main services. Now, Cloud Identity and Access Management refers to a framework of policies and technologies for ensuring that the proper people in your enterprise have the appropriate access to your technology resources. We don't want to just let everybody in. We want to make sure that the right people are coming in and they have the right access that they're supposed to. Now, Google always, always explains this framework is about who has access to which resources, right? The who, what, which resources thing. And setting up your hierarchy first will really help security teams kind of keep track of who has access to what. And what's important here is to make sure you're understanding the level of permissions you are giving out when you're assigning roles to people and what policies that you're enforcing on folders, your projects and resources, because overly assigning permissions can give too much power to a user and lead to further trouble down the line. Now, cloud uh, DLP, also called data loss prevention, that's an API that really helps organizations manage their sensitive data, right? So you might be a company who might be using like G Suite, right, for example, and you want to keep track of what information your users are using and then how they are, how, what information is leaving your environment. And we all know we don't want data leaks to happen. So this tool really provides a fast and scalable kind of classification for sensitive data elements like your credit card numbers, your social security number, your passports. And it's not just for the United States, it's for everywhere around the globe. Okay, it's demo time. We're doing good on time too. Okay, so what we'll be doing first is we're gonna open the console to really understand IAM roles. And then we're going to add a role to our environment. We're gonna assign it some permissions to a virtual machine and then we're gonna test those permissions, okay? <laughs> Let me stop sharing real quick so I can get the environment up for you guys. Cool. I'm gonna leave that there. Um, okay, I see there was a quick question. It says, what is the best practice for cloud security? Is it NIST? Um, um, best practice comes from a variety of things, right? NIST offers a framework for you to begin your um, cloud security, for you to uh, base your cloud security posture on, right? So you have NIST. You have CIS, um, those, they provide benchmarks. There's um, the Cloud Security Alliance. Um, there's a bunch of different organizations um, that provide frameworks for you to assess your security posture. So my, my, my best answer here would be for you to assess where you are, compare it against one, two, or all three. Um, and then use that as a baseline. As long as you're hitting that baseline, that framework for NIST, right? Say if you want to base it off of NIST, right? If you want to base it off of NIST, make sure you're hitting all the NIST baselines and then go a little bit more or you don't have to depending on the security needs of your environment. So it really kind of just depends. There, NIST, is the, NIST is a very popular one, but I'm not going to say that that's like the best one. Okay, demo. Where's my screen? <laughs> cool. <laughs> okay. Boom, boom, let's share this. OK. 
Okay. She's going to Okay, can everyone see my dashboard environment? Let me hide my bookmarks bar. <laughs> Wait, let me move the chat as well. Uh, can you guys see? Oh, give it a second. Okay, cool. All right, cool. Now. This is the Google Cloud Platform uh, dashboard. <laughs> um, it is a lot happening right here. And let me make sure I'm on my dashboard that this is the main one, right? So what you'll see in your dashboard is you'll see a bunch of little box panes. I forgot the name that they call this. But these are little um, box panes that you can move around. As you can see, I kind of drag and drop, right? And these are different boxes that you can set up to have a one-stop shop for your dashboard to know what's happening in your environment. So as you can see here, I was doing some testing. So I have Compute Engine here and you can see that there's some data going like there's a lot of things happening. APIs, requests, that's associated with my Compute Engine. So you'll see a lot of things going on here. On the side, it'll tell you your billing charges, you know, your platform status, whether or not some services are down, if you need to check something, the status of any of your cloud services, whether or not there's any error reporting. Um, they also give you like a news pamphlet to tell you like what's happening um, in the Google Cloud, whether or not that's maybe some new services, new changes, just anything that's happening in the news environment. Um, you can see your resources, your trace, X, Y, Z. You can do, you can uh, customize this. Um, so say for example, you don't want the get started to be there anymore. Maybe I want to add app engine. Um, maybe I don't want my trace. You can do that. And then you can customize your dashboard for how you would want it to look. So for today, we are going to dive into IAM. So on the left hand side, these are all of the resources and services in Google Cloud Platform. And it goes from your marketplace all the way down to IAM. It covers compute, which we're gonna get into, which is you know your app engine, compute engine, X, Y, Z. It covers storage, networking services, operation services, tools, yeah, big data, for those of you interested in big data like IoT and BigQuery, uh, which is a, a really good big database um, warehouse, uh, artificial intelligence, like you, you can access everything from over here. So you have all the power now being in this, being in the platform. So, but for today, we are going to go into IAM. So please navigate to IAM and that will open up a pane here. Now, the first thing it's going to open up when you see identity and access permission, um, identity and access management are permissions for project, aka my first project, right? On the uh, top sort of left hand corner, you'll see this little drop down that says my first project, right? When you click on it, it will say select a project. These are all the projects available in my current environment. You can click on all. Um, and I'll get into a little bit about organizations later, but if you click on all, you'll see these are all the projects that are available, right? But I am in my first project. And within here, now you'll see members and roles. Members are users who are in your environment. So for example, I have created a user with my email address and my name, and I am the owner. These are, this is a service account these two are, all three of them are service accounts, which are members within my organization that have a certain kind of role, right? And then if I click on roles, it kind of just gives you a better breakdown of like, who's an owner, me, who's an editor, those two service accounts, who has compute engine access to the service account, X, Y, Z. It really helps you keep track of who's in your environment, who has access to what, to make sure that not everyone has too much permissions. So for our purpose, we're going to add a member to our environment, right? So I'm going to press add this, and let me move this out of the way. 
you'll have a little panel that will come up and I'll ask you, who is this member that you're trying to add? And I want to add, I have, remember when I said you should have um, maybe two accounts so that way you can go back and forth. So I have another demo account <laughs> that I'm going to add to this environment, right? And it'll populate for me if it's familiar with it, which it is, right? And then you need to select a role. What role do I want this email address or this user to have in my environment? So for our purposes, we're gonna be sticking with kind of compute networking and firewall um, uh, roles here. So what you're gonna do in the role is you're gonna look for compute network. And when that comes up, you're gonna choose the compute network admin. Now, as you can see, whenever you're typing in to here, if you just put compute, for example, it'll show you all the compute, um, all of the roles that start or have in compute included. But if you narrow down a little bit more and you put network, it'll just get a little bit more granular and show you the specific roles for compute network, <clears throat> excuse me. So what we want is compute network admin. As you can see, it lets you know what kind of permissions come with this role. And this role has full control of compute engine networking resources, right? In comparison to maybe a compute network resource, I mean, a, a compute network user who only has access to use compute engine networking resources, they don't have full control. We want the one that has full control. So we're gonna click on that, we're gonna click on save, Boom, now you see the devslap demo at gmail.com now has the role of compute network administrator. So there we have just now created, now you can use your own email address. So for example, if you didn't use your normal personal email address when you created this account, if you have another email address, type that one in, right? So this is just a second email I have access to, type a second one in. So now we just created and added a new user to our environment. Next, we're going to create a custom IAM role, right? Because this user in particular has compute network full admin access. Maybe I want them to just have access to be able to just control firewall rules, right? I might, if in a real world scenario, if I'm the administrator, I have a, a firewall team and I might have a, another stock analyst or like I might have stock analysts and I want them to have different permissions within my cloud environment. I do not want each of them to have full rights permissions for everything. They just need to be able to access what I need them to access. So this is where kind of creating custom roles or giving custom permissions kind of come into play. So we're going to give this person a custom role. So you do this by on the left hand side again, because this is our main navigation, we're going to go to roles. And I think I already kind of have one if I didn't delete it. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I deleted it, but I'm gonna do it again. <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to create a role. And in creating role, we're going to call this firewall admin, right? Description, they kind of defaulted to, oh, this was created on this date, which is helpful, especially for keeping track of like when this role was created and investigating, did I create this role? If I'm an administrator, do I remember? This is where you really put notes, right? So I can say created on here by Dominique, right? So that way, if I was to come back and say, I don't remember giving you this permission, just to say, hey, girl, you did. You might want to recheck or rethink what, what you're saying. Um, so in terms of ID, ID is just an identifier. So we can go ahead and we're gonna call this firewall admin. It's really good to put really descriptive, I feel like that's redundant. I was gonna say really descriptive description. <laughs> Making sure that you have really good descriptions whenever you're setting up roles and environments because it once things start going, like once you once an organization kind of gets started and you don't put these descriptions in, you don't really call out what this particular maybe um, service account, what this role is, things can get very confusing because say, for example, uh, the person who set up your cloud environment, if they leave your company and the next person who inherits your cloud environment come in, they're like, I have no idea what any of this stuff is because there's no descriptions. There's nothing kind of telling me what's happening here. So we're going to put firewall admin as the ID. 
And then we're going to roll launch. We have alpha, beta. Oh, sorry, we'll admin one. <laughs> um, you can put beta. Now, what we're going to do is now we're going to add permissions, right? So we're going to filter. In the filter table, you can filter by permission, by service, by type, or by status. We are going to filter for firewall. So we're going to enter in firewall. And then, hold on, let me do this. Use the filter. Cool. We're going to put in firewall, and now we're going to add all of the permissions that are associated with a compute firewall. So that would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? Recommender, compute, we can add that because that has compute in there as well. And this also has compute as well. So everything that has compute in it, we want to add, right? Because we want to give this particular role all firewall compute permissions, right? So I'm going to press add. And now you can see that 10 assigned permissions has been added to this firewall admin role that we have created. Now with that, you can see it says added permissions down here. And we're going to press create. That should take like a quick second, right? Now we're going to go ahead and double check. You see my ooh, firewall admin role has been created here. Now you see how before I had a firewall admin role and um, I don't know if you saw, I had to put a one next to it for the ID because that ID has already been used in my particular environment and therefore I can't use it again. So once you already create an ID and assign it to someone, even if you delete it, it will still be referenced. So you're going to have to keep track of whether or not you use something Google will tell you, but you have to keep track of the names, especially if you have more than one custom roles. Okay, so now that we had a custom role, we're going to assign it. So by doing this, we're going to go to IAM. IAM and roles are the two kind of categories that we're going back and forth with. So we're gonna come back to my newly added member. When we press edit, we're gonna say add another role. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add, I'm gonna filter by firewall now you see how my firewall admin, the role that we just created, and we know it just created because it said created by Dominique. Um, we're gonna click on that. So now the desktop demo member that I added, we gave them first compute network admin um, permissions. And now I'm adding another role. I want them to control my firewall. So then we, and we're gonna press save, but before I press save, I just wanted to um, briefly highlight, you see on the right hand side, it says condition. You can add a condition and conditions are kind of just a set of rules of, that apply to this. So for example, if I wanna say, I only want them to have access during certain days of the week or certain hours of the day, like nine to five, I don't want this person to be able to access my environment outside of working business hours or on the weekends, or if I want their access to expire Maybe we'll say like a week from now, I can say this is going to expire from a week from now and access will be revoked upon right after this date at 12 a.m. But we're not going to do that in this case. We're not going to do that in this case. We're going to press save. And now you see our newly added member has two roles now. They're a firewall admin and a compute network admin. Okay. Next. So now we're going to create another custom role because what we're going to do now is see, like I gave him two different roles, right? A firewall admin, um, I gave him granular permissions um, that I particularly gave, but he also has compute network admin, which is a general one that Google gave that might have too many permissions that I'm not comfortable with. So I'm going to create another custom role that combines the two with permissions I just want him to have and reassign it to him. Give me a second, I'll get some water. <laughs> Okay, so for the new one, we're gonna head back over to roles. <clears throat> and what we're gonna do is we're gonna filter 
for compute admin, which is what we, oh, excuse me, not compute admin, compute network admin, right? And then you're going to click or, and then you're going to do firewall admin. So now what this just did, filtering in the table when you come under roles, is that it now we filtered using an or condition. So I want to see all roles that have to do with compute network admin or a firewall admin, right? And as you can see from here, it shows me compute network admin, firewall admin, those are the ones I had before. But we also have another firewall admin and compute network admin that's enabled, right? If you see deleted, you can't use these roles because they've been removed from my environment, but they're just there for you to be able to see. Um, if I click them again, you see I can't delete them because they've already been deleted or if they're pending deletion X, Y, Z. But what we're going to do is for the ones that are enabled in your environment, because you shouldn't see disabled, you're going to click on firewall admin, you're going to click on compute network admin, and you're going to say, I'm going to create a new role based off of these two roles. So like you're combining the two roles to create one role. Now in here, you're going to say, I want this to be this is going to be called a compute network and firewall role. And we're going to say description again, created on such and such date based off of the compute network admin and firewall admin role by Dominique again, just for a little bit more uh, specific. Um, ID, we're going to call this compute. And firewall, I'm going to say role because I don't think I can use, yeah, okay, good. I can use that one. Cool. I'm going to put that in beta. Now, when it comes to permissions, you see it has 283 assigned permissions. That's how many permissions are in these two roles that this is based off of. Now, if you don't want this person to have all of those permissions, you would just remove it here, right? I would say, I don't want them to be able to create internal addresses on the compute engine, or I don't want them to be able to create addresses at all. So I would remove that. Or maybe click over. I don't want them to be able to create an external VPN gateway. I don't want them to be able to have access to the, or update the backend services. All of these are all the permissions that come with those two, um, but we're combining them into one role for this particular person, right? Now they'll give you a bunch of different um, warnings in case you know this permission can only be added to a custom role or production. It's not recommended for production use. Um, all of these warnings they'll have at the end, but for our purpose, we're, we're going to ahead and create it. So you know what we're doing. So now. As you see, we have our first custom one that was enabled called the firewall admin role. And now we have a compute network and firewall role that we just created that is also enabled. So we're going to head back over to IAM. We're going to assign the new role again, but we're going to take away some permissions, right? So what we're going to do here is we're going to trash the firewall admin one. And we can trash compute network. And then we're going to add a role. And we're going to look for the role that we just created. So it's called compute. I was about to say, I forgot what I called it already. <laughs> and firewall. There you go. That's the role that I had just created or we just created. And I'm assigning it to this person. Now, when I press save, they are assigned this role. Now, we want to make sure that this actually works, right? We want to say, OK, I've assigned this person a role. What that means is that when they log into their, to their GCP environment, they should see whatever compute resources, firewall resources I create in my environment. And that's it. And we're going to test that. So we're going to come here to the navigation menu. We're going to come down to Compute Engine. Now, if this is your, this is probably your first time um, opening Compute Engine. So let me remove this tutorial. And let's see, can I? Okay, there we go. So you can see the whole thing. So if this is your first time, it might take you a couple of seconds. It might have, you might see a little box that says create or 
um, import or you need to get it started, give it a couple of seconds, it's gonna start up. It shouldn't take longer than maybe 30 seconds. So while you are doing that, I'm gonna take some more water. <laughs> And once you're in, you should see nothing. This should be blank or it should say create an instance. So we're going to create, uh, there are a question. What are the different role stages when you create a custom role? Is alpha mean production? So they have like alpha, beta, X, Y, Z roles. So you see how we put into beta and we had a little warning at the bottom that says like, you might not want to put this into production or X, Y, Z. So they, um, Google is always creating different kinds of custom roles, different kinds of permissions that you can do with things. And some of them um, can be are, are fully flushed out and can be alpha, which means you can put them in production and they'll be fine. And some of them, not so much, you put them in beta mode. So that way they're not fully fledged into production environments yet. Um, you, I suggest um, kind of checking out their roadmap to see how a lot of their alpha and beta um, features are rolling out. Um, but that's how you can kind of, sometimes they might tell you like, hey, this is a product still in beta, but we're, uh, we're kind of rolling it out for customers to test or for you to test, or hey, you know, this has been taken out of beta and now you can fully use it. Okay. Next, let's verify. So if you have this open, what we're gonna do is we're going to create an instance. So by creating an instance, what we're essentially doing is we're creating a virtual machine. Now you can leave everything as default, but you know, I don't like doing that. So I'm gonna say, oh yeah, lowercase. Everything must be lowercase. Google will tell you like, hey girl, you are not following the permissions that we are telling you. So we're gonna say demo testing firewall. And then you have labels, which you can add labels, which are optional. Um, you see how over here automatically tells you how many trial credits you're using, because I already have one virtual machine. <laughs> and it'll tell you, say, hey, this, this particular machine will cost you $24 a month, which is about 34 cents um, hourly. But it'll change once you see once we change a couple of the other settings. So um, labels are to apply, for example, if this is going to be in production versus in um, testing. So you can differentiate which virtual machines are in production or say if you wanna say, hey, I wanna tag this is on the East Coast versus this is on the West Coast, that's what you can apply labels for. Region is permanent, zone is permanent. So you want to make sure that you are putting the right um, region and zone the first time around because you cannot change it and you will have to remove the entire virtual machine. So for our purposes, I am closest to East, which is North Virginia or South Carolina, South Carolina, which is US East B automatically kind of populates one for you, but you can choose either or. Um, each one of these are kind of redundant zones within this region. A zone is, so think of a region as um, things like the United States or Asia or uh, South America, <laughs> like those are large regions. And then within those regions, they kind of break them up um, into even more granularity, right? So then you have, as we saw, US East 1, which is like over in South Carolina or North Virginia, those are where they have data centers. And then you have Los Angeles, if you're on the West Coast, uh, Las Vegas, um, Europe. Asia, like I said, uh, Seoul, all that kind of good stuff. You would choose where you need your data to be. And this is especially important when I told you about meeting compliance, because say, for example, you're a company that cannot have your data leave the United States, for example. If your data can't leave the United States and you pick Europe or you pick somewhere else and then you get audited, they're like, hey, you have data routing to um, data centers in Finland, like you are now out of compliance. So it's really important to make sure you know where this is going. So we're gonna come back to South Carolina. Uh, as in terms of machine configuration, make it small. So you see how automatically my price went down once I made it small. So we're gonna make your machine type small. 
And we can leave everything as is because we're not going to be doing too much. I just want to actually make sure you allow HTTP traffic. Um, and HTTPS, sorry, excuse me, just double checking. Cool. Now go ahead and press create. So what this will do is create this virtual machine that is now called Domino's Testing Firewall. And what will happen here is it'll take a little bit of second, but once it turns in, if you highlight over it, said this instance is being created, you'll know it's finished because you'll see a green check mark that'll say it's running. There we go, green check mark. And also on the right hand side, you'll see here kind of a list of notifications letting you know like what has been created and what hasn't. Cool, so now we've created a virtual machine. Now I want to show you whether or not my other um, person has access to this virtual machine, right? So let's check, let's hope. Okay, cool. Let's bring up my other, can I drag this over? Oh no, I think you're only gonna see. Let me share the desktop so you can see. One second. That's the trouble of working with two screens. It's like you gotta go back and forth with everything. <laughs> but I want you to see, okay. You come here. You come here. Let me see, I lost my screen. There we go. Okay, cool. So I wanted to be able to show you my second role. Cool. You should be able to see my screen shortly. And this, I'm gonna come to the dashboard. Move all these things out of the way. Cool. So, and this is my Deslap demo uh, second account. And here you can see all of the projects or things that I have in here. I don't have anything really running, so you won't see um, as much. Um, and it says I do not have permission for certain things, right? So if you come up to my first project, you probably will see a bunch of different ones, right? We wanna make sure that I'm under the project I created in my first resource. So let me pull up the name. Okay, cool. Let me make this smaller so we can see both of them. Side by side. Awesome. Okay, cool. Now, this is uh, on the left hand side is my first project that we've been creating on the right hand side is the second member that we added to our demo. So demos, demos testing firewall. This is under the project called single effect. I'm going to come under my first project under single effect make sure I'm in there. And when I come here, if I come to Compute Engine, I should see Demos Testing Firewall. So now as you see, I'm logged in as two people right now. I'm logged in on the left-hand side as Demos Testing Firewall, and on the right-hand side, I mean, excuse me, on the left-hand side as my original user one, and on the right-hand side as user two. Um, and now I have permissions, user two has permissions. I can click in here. I can't do SSH, right? Because that's not the permission I gave them. I only gave them permission to control firewall. So if I come in here and I look around, you should be able to see. No, that's not where I want to go. I 
as you can see, there's different um, firewall rules, firewall policies that runs in beta. There's firewall rules. I can click on a firewall rule and then I can edit, right? I can turn it, turn the logs on for Stack Driver, which we'll be doing later. I can turn them off, X, Y, Z. So now you see that this person has permission. So you know that what you did was correct. All right, so that's our first demo. Let's go ahead and get into the second one. That one can take a little bit longer. Okay. Let's switch back over to our slides so that way I can let you know what we're doing next. Okay, cool. Let's share this out. No, going back and forth is <laughs> Okay, cool. That was our first demo. I hope you learned a little bit more about IAM roles. Next, we're gonna jump into Compute Engine. Compute, uh, Google Compute has three main services. They are Google App Engine, Compute Engine, and Kubernetes Engine. Google App Engine is a platform as a service model um, that really helps you kind of deploy applications using Java, PHP, other things. <clears throat> it's a cloud computing platform really for developing and hosting web applications. And one second. Okay, can you see my screen? <laughs> okay, cool. Let's get this back. Yeah, so um, Google Cloud um, App Engine, again, really for developers. Google Cloud Compute Engine is what we just got a little taste of before. It is their infrastructure as a service resource. That's where you will spin up virtual machines. You can customize a virtual machine, as we saw, so you can put them in specific regions. You can put them um, in specific zones, again, according to compliance. You can change. So we had like a Debian um, virtual machine, but you can change it to something that's smaller, right? As you saw, we had the default one and that was like $24 a month. And you're like, hey, that's too costly for me. What I'm running on the virtual machine is really small. I'm not even going to have it for that long. Or it might be something that can be um, turned off and shut off in case of uh, the resources needing um, more bandwidth. And therefore, I just need to make this smaller. So you can change and customize it according to how you need it. And then from there, go ahead and deploy whatever application, install whatever you need to, and update it. Now, remember when I said about infrastructure as a service, you have to manage and maintain it yourself. So Google doesn't do that for you. It definitely expects you to know and to keep up with your application. Uh, GCP is a uh, Kubernetes is the last one. That's about containerized applications, which is outside of the scope of what we'll be talking about today excuse me, today, but if you're definitely interested in containerization and container security and application security, I definitely recommend looking into their um, Kubernetes engine. It is open source, which means um, it's not confined just to Google. A lot of people can build um, applications on top of it or use it as like a foundation to build um, containerized applications there. So I believe we're going back into demo. Yeah, <laughs> I like stopped and switched just to stop and switch again. Okay, so we're going back into the console. Let me minimize all these things that I have. Nope, wrong one, right one, wrong one.
So bring your console back up. Oh, that's why. Because I closed it. It's okay. Um, cool you should see my console now um this is a different account so it will not have the same virtual machine that we just had but you should still have the same virtual machine which is fine <laughs> cool so from here what we're going to be doing now is just setting up a basic cloud to um development environment, we're going to spin up a virtual machine and we're going to install a Nginx, Nginx web application on it. So come back to your compute engine, VM instances. Oh, that's it. Are you going to make me switch? Give me two seconds <laughs> so I can switch accounts. And that's why sometimes like if you have more than one account, sometimes it's easier to kind of open things in incognito mode. So that way you don't run into that issue because like you might have some test accounts you might be doing one thing on and then it, it'll be confusing if you enabled billing on one you didn't enable on another. Really. Luckily, I have so many that it's okay. <laughs> um, all right, let's open it up. Cool. Well, let's get to sharing again. Desktop. Cool. I'm gonna select my Thomas project. Cool. Now, come back to VM instances. Now, in this instance, again, instance one, or it'll be the name of the instance that you just created. So we're gonna go ahead and create a new one because you wanna have different virtual machines for different purposes. You don't wanna put everything that you're doing on one virtual machine because you might mix some things up or what if you accidentally delete it and then you delete all of the applications or whatever it is that you installed on there things can get a little bit crazy so for this one we're just going to call it and oh yes lowercase nginx test test cool i'm going to go back again and i'm going to pick the region and zone closest to me um so i pick just South Carolina, I'm going to leave it at default. I'm going to change this to a shared, when it comes to shared core, pick the small and micro. I'll pick micro for this purpose. So now you see the price dropped even more drastically. It dropped to $4.28, which we like. We like to save money around here. <laughs> um, Debian, you can keep it, you can leave it. Um, but if you want to change it, for example, and we wanted to maybe change it to Ubuntu, right? And that'll give us the latest default one, or you can pick another different one, but we'll leave the, I'll keep them. Right? So under identity and API access, which will tell you what service account, because whenever you create a virtual machine, it will automatically create a service account for you, which will act on behalf of that virtual machine. As a, as a member, I don't know if you remember when we were in our IAM, there were different service accounts. Those service accounts are created by virtual machines. So for here, we want to allow full access to all cloud APIs and we want to allow HTTP and HTTPS traffic. So let's go ahead and create. Now it'll take a couple of seconds. As you can see on the right, it's creating and on the left, it is being created. Cool. 
All right, cool. It is finished. Now, what we want to do is we want to log into this virtual machine, right? And you can do so by clicking SSH. Now, what that will do is open up, depending on if you have like your browser huge or not, it will open up another web, um, another tab. And what this is doing is this is establishing a connection to this virtual machine so that way we can do some things on it, install applications, update it, maintain it, patch it, X, Y, Z. So as you can see, it has my name and the name of the virtual machine there. So what we're going to do is we're gonna to switch to root and you can do that by going to sudo i. And now you will see I switched to root at nginx test. And now as a root user, I want to update this virtual machine, right? Because the virtual machine is just created and it doesn't have any of the updated patches or anything that's come out for this um, particular OS. So what we're gonna do, the command for that is app get update. And it will go through a couple of seconds, kind of updating, going out to the internet, grabbing the packages and installing their packages, the appropriate packages on this virtual machine. And that is done, that was quick. <laughs> then we're gonna do app get and we're gonna install minus Y and G I N X. So that's app slash get space install space dash Y, which is for yes. Um, and then Nginx, which is the name of the application that we're installing on here. The dash Y is for yes, because sometimes when you're installing things, it'll ask you, do you wanna do this? Yes or no, it kind of helps prevent all of that. So it'll just say yes for me. Cool, that's done, these things are quick. And then we wanna go ahead and start the service. Now we know it started by if we come over here back to our environment and I don't think we can, um, oh yeah, there we go. I'm just gonna refresh. Now, if I click on the external um, IP address, why are you not letting me? I'm a copy to clipboard. Okay, so if you copy um, what it's supposed to do is if you click the external IP, it should open into a new tab, the actual application we just installed. But if it does not, as you just saw in mine, if you just copy the external IP, if you type it into the website, I mean, into the URL bar, you will see it says, welcome to Nginx. If you saw this, it's successful. That's how we know that we just successfully installed an application on a virtual machine. Good job, guys. Now, let's come back. Now that we know it's working, let's go ahead and modify, right? Say if this is a, a website that we wanted to spin up and we want to make some changes to it. We can do that by going back to our command line or back to the SSH session that we were in. And from here, we're going to CD over into what's called var.www.html. So now, as you can see down here, I have successfully changed over into a new folder. And from there, I'm going to do sudo uh, install. We're going to install nano, which is a command line or like a, what do you call it? A text editor. I'm like losing my train of thought. It's a text editor that will allow you to um, edit things like web applications on the back end. So we installed it, as you can see. Nano is already on the newest version and it was already installed. Cool. Now, what we want to do is move over into it. So we're going to nano into index.nginx slash Debian.html. Now you can see this opens the text editor, right? And this reflects the verbiage in the page that we opened on here, right? If you see this page, this means it's successfully installed. So we wanna edit this, right? We want this to say a different message. We wanna say, welcome to Domo's world because <laughs> I always like to do that. So welcome to Domo's world. <laughs> and I wanna say, if you see this page, no. And you, you can change anything on here. Make sure you save it, but I'll show you how to do that in a second. But I'm changing everything. <laughs> Demo's world. I'm going to say this 
session was a success. Hooray. <laughs> okay, so now to save any changes that you made, you want to write it out to the file. So you can do that by pressing Control Zero, I believe. And it says file name to write, which is the index.index, which we were at. We want to say yes. And then it will write out the file. Now, if you want to exit, you're going to press Control X. You're out of the file. And if you want to exit the entire session altogether, you would press exit. But we want to test and we want to make sure what we did was correct. So at the top, you can see it says, Welcome to Damo's World is now in the browse, is now in the uh, little URL tab. Um, but it says that this session was a success. Hooray, I've changed it. Cool, nice. So now we wanna exit and we'll exit out. And now I'm out of that. So now we have successfully uh, spun up two virtual machines actually. On the first one, we just kind of did some um, role assignments to kind of uh, view that. But for the second one, we spun up a virtual machine, we installed the web application, we edited the web application, and then we tested to make sure that our edits went through. Cool, now we are just out here. We're just, everyone is now a infrastructure as a service guru. I hope you guys go out and now you guys can teach everyone else. Okay, let's jump into our last one because we are winding down. So for our last one, let's share the screen again. <laughs> Can you see my screen, my slides? Cool. All right. So we've done two whole demos already. Okay. Sorry, I have too many things. Up. All right, cool. Now for the last one. I know this slide goes against all presentation rules. I'm not going through this entire list, but I wanted to showcase the extensive security tools that Google offers to their cloud customers. Um, it goes from everything from IAM and DLP, which we kind of mentioned before, um, all the way to Security Command Center for SOC teams. Um, please take a screenshot of this so you can get familiar with the different kind of tools and products they have, but this is what they offer. Um, for the purposes of this last demo that we have, which should be um, really quick, we're just going to do Stackdriver. We're going to install Stackdriver on the virtual machine that we just created. Stackdriver is an application that allows you to kind of attach to any virtual machines, any applications that you create, so that way you can monitor if something should happen, right? If the virtual machine goes down, if there's an error, if it's not doing what it's supposed to do, Stackdriver will definitely let you know. And like I said before, we kind of already went through IAM. Okay, back to security. <laughs> I mean, back to the demo. Okay, now please bring up your, well, you probably already have your, you're not switching back and forth like I am. <laughs> um, bring back up your demo. Cool, you should see my um, screen again. And from here, we are going to dive right back in. I'm going to move all these screens out of my way. Zoom, get out of my way. All right, cool. Now, deploying cloud monitoring solution. So what we're going to do, let's come back to these Nginx tests. Now, I know you. I told you um, not to install multiple things on one virtual machine, but this is a security solution needed for the virtual machine, so it's okay. <laughs> so we're going to um, SSH in. Sometimes it takes a second. Cool, we're back in. 
what we're going to do first is we're going to do, we already did the update. So we're going to install an Apache server. Excuse me. And if you do sudo app get install Apache 2 PHP 7.0, it will go ahead and install for you. So you see how it says, do you want to continue? Yes or no? I should have put the yes, I forgot. You just press Y, press enter, it'll go ahead and continue. <clears throat> That'll take a couple of seconds. It has a lot to create. Cool. We're going to do sudo service Apache 2 restart. Now that's restarting the service. So we might not see it right away. You can always test it by clicking your external link or in my case, because my external link does not respect me as a human being. Now you see you have an Apache Ubuntu default page. This means you successfully installed Apache on here. Cool. Now you want to install Stackdriver on here as well. You're going to come over here to the hamburger navigation pane. We're going to come down to monitoring. If this is your first time coming into monitoring, you will see these little boxes. There's boxes everywhere. <laughs> You'll see these boxes that says I'm getting started up. So while that is happening, I'll kind of just walk you through things just so that way you can have it on the recording. So what we're going to do here <clears throat> is we want to install the agents onto our virtual machine. And we can do that by either doing it in the terminal um, or doing, say, it's install agents, right? So if we want to install an agent, what it will say is if you says set up monitoring and logging agents, it will give you instructions for the monitoring agent and the logging agent, two different agents that needs to be installed in order for this to properly work. You want to properly log what's happening on your application and then you probably want to monitor and alert you for whatever is happening, right? So we are going to enter the commands. So if you click on um, kind of like installing the monitoring agent, what it should do, oh, so is it because is it I already installed it? Come back. That's okay, I already have the commands. So we're gonna come back to our command center and you're gonna do this. You're going to do these two commands down here. The first one being a curl command and what curl is gonna do is it's going to go out and reach out to the internet and grab this URL um, in order to install the agent. And then the second one is another one where you're installing the monitoring. So when you press enter, it'll go through a series of commands. And these commands are in your environment. So it's nothing specific to my environment. You have the same commands. You can def you should you will find them um, when you get into your stack monitoring section. <laughs> That's where you'll find them. And then I'm going to do the same for my logging, right? Because again, we need two agents. There's a logging agent. There's two commands for the logging agent, two commands for the monitoring agent in order for you to properly install both of them. So while that is happening, we can come back to settings and you can see we have our workspace is called Damos Project because that was our project in the beginning. And then you can see you have overview, dashboard, metrics, alerting, uptime checks, groups, et cetera. What we want to do while that's installing is we want to have something called an uptime check, which means whenever something happens, I want to be alerted about it, right? So like, for example, I have here, it's called my first uptime check, right? Now, what this is going to do is that this is checking that every time uh, a call over HTTP or port 80 happens, I want it to be logged. And then if it goes over a certain threshold, then I want it to be alerted. So for example, if I'm being overloaded with HTTP requests, then uh, over maybe say like a thousand, then I want that to be alerted to me, right? And this is where you would, you would 
um, create that. Since I kind of already had one, I wanted to check every minute. Um, I wanted to check for log failures. Um, I called it just the first uptime check. You can test it, you can do advanced things. Um, this is gonna um, fail because I had this on a different virtual machine, but this is where you would do all of that information. And then when it comes to alerting, because again, monitoring and alerting goes hand in hand. This is where you would see all of this information here, right? Now, I didn't attach it yet because it was still installing. And then, you, you know, your virtual machine needs to uh, do some things. Like you, you know, how we uh, kind of did some edits on our um, first server. We, that, like, that will show here. Or if you maybe installed some more applications or if you did some more network or you tried to do some more testing, like you should see um, and then you create some policies that we just said, like the uptime checks, you will see all of the alerts here. It will show you some incidents. It will show you the policies that you had. So for example, like I had an ingress policy that was saying, you know, anytime a packet is received that is above the threshold of 500 greater for one minute, I want you to email me, right? You'll see all of that here. So that's where you create policies. So under this monitoring is where you can really keep track of all the security uh, of your virtual machines. So that way you're alert if you need to troubleshoot anything, if you need to kind of just monitor again to make sure ingress, like you're not being overloaded on this virtual machine, maybe you might need to spin up something else so you can kind of balance the load between two virtual machines. Like this really kind of helps, gives you the insights um, that you won't have if you don't have a monitoring solution attached up. As I said before, it's really important to have monitoring solutions so that you know what you have. Okay. I think we are close to the end here. Switching back and forth. Cool. Can you see my screen, my slides? All right. So as a recap, we've done a lot today, guys. We went over cloud security, a 10,000 foot overview. We did some service models. We learned about deployment models, which is like, you know, the infrastructure as a service versus software as a service, public versus hybrid versus multi-cloud. We learned about some benefits, some shared responsibilities, and some challenges that enterprises might face. We went through a demo of learning how to add members or add roles, excuse me, add members to our environment, create custom roles, um, spin up a virtual machine, install things on virtual machines, and use Stackdriver to attach it in order to better monitor our environment, which is super important, right? So with that, thank you so, 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 so much for coming to my session. I really hope you learned something. I know it was a lot. I believe these are being recorded. So if they are, um, hopefully you'll be able to go back and kind of reference it in order to continue to build that foundation. There are plenty of um, kind of courses out there that really helps build upon this so that way you can do a little bit more and then become your own cloud security professional. Uh, I would love to hear your feedback on this or where you are in your journey. You're more than welcome to reach out to me on social media. My at name is Damibu on every social media. I'm too lazy to have different names for different things. So you can find me everywhere on the same name, or you can connect with me on LinkedIn. Just find Dominique West and you can uh, connect with me there. Um, or if you're interested more in the cloud and cybersecurity platform that I have, you can search for securityincolor.com. That's where I post a lot of articles about what's happening in the world. Um, I'm doing my like Azure security studying upcoming. So if you're interested in that, I'm definitely going to be doing a 30 day, not a boot camp, but like a 30 day study group kind of thing where I'll just kind of be blasting out what I'm learning until I take the test. So if you're interested in that, I definitely recommend going to Security in Color, joining the mailing list because that's where I'll be putting it, and then uh, subscribing to the podcast because that's where I kind of talk about all these things of security and cloud and all that kind of good stuff. So thank you so very much. Um, I'll see if there's any other questions. Or